a little ditty about Jack and Diane, who will eventually inherit about four and a half million dollars from Diane's parents. How do they manage the required minimum distributions? Which of three options should Matt take with his inherited IRA? Making the most of your inheritance. That's today on Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 435. Plus, Clay wants to know if it's a good idea to take money off the table and rebalance to safer or more aggressive investments, depending on your risk tolerance. Can Elizabeth offset pre-tax IRA losses with the gains from the sale of rental real estate? Is it true that you can make one-time contributions from your IRA to your HSA, that is your health savings account? And finally, can Corey gift stock to his daughters and avoid paying the kitty tax as a way to pay for college? And can Rich supercharge a 529 college savings plan with himself as beneficiary? I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Cliff and Norm. I mean, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. Got a uh, new listener here, AYMYW team. I'm a new listener, and I thoroughly enjoy the podcast. I feel like I have found my tribe. Wow. Yeah. I like that. We're, Welcome. We're part of this tribe. Welcome to the tribe. Okay, we got a couple people. We got Jack and Diane. Yeah, right? okay. So and I will say, this is not Jim from Santa Cruz's Jack and Diane. This is a completely new Jack and Diane. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Got it. Uh, Jack's 58, gainfully employed, makes about $100,000 a year. Guinness is the drink of choice. Yeah, right. I, I like Guinness. Diane, 52, an RN who cares for elderly parents, earns fifteen dollars to $20,000 per year in royalties. Ah. Ooh, she a writer. Which, yeah. Maybe actor. Yeah. Painter. Musician. Ooh. <laughs> an RN who also has royalties or... Not sure how that works. She probably did something some on the side. Something a little side hustle. Yeah. yeah. Make her some cash. Loves a good margarita. We live in Texas and are 100% debt free. I drive a Honda Civic. She drives a Honda SUV. Oh, well, she's, Honda family. Yeah. She's got the big car. <laughs> well, she's got the royalties. Yeah, she does. <laughs> That's worth a lot. Uh, they, they're not going to stop when, she, when, when Jack retires. That's it. I guarantee you something really cool <laughs> yeah uh we got annual expenses of seventy thousand dollars a year uh agi is ninety thousand uh ninety three thousand now 2023 projected agi is 122 okay all right three hundred sixty thousand dollars in an ira got ninety thousand in a 401k and fifty six thousand dollars in a roth currently adding fifteen hundred dollars a month to a 457 roth in max annual contributions for each of us in a normal roth ira got another hundred sixty four thousand dollars in a brokerage account fifty thousand dollars cash emergency fund two hundred thousand in cash from a recent sale of a real estate uh, these funds are pending reinvestment all right now you with me keep them square yeah. you're good Oh yeah, and another three fifty in two different government things. <laughs> we gotta add that too. Also, one one point three. <laughs> got another three hundred fifty thousand in two different government pensions. Sorry, Jack and Diane, that was on page two. Got it. It. Pension one eligible to draw now twenty two thousand dollars per year will grow at seven percent per year if I continue to delay the start of the payments. Pension two eligible at age sixty two. At twenty four thousand dollars per year, stops growing when I stop working. So, not starting payments the day after I retire would be leaving money on the table. Oh, thanks, thanks for that. Okay, <laughs> Did that clarify for you. Appreciate that. Nice. Uh, pending inheritance. Parents are in early nineties, somewhat mobile. Uh, <laughs> somewhat mobile, <laughs> mobility impaired. <laughs> I guess that's somewhat mobile. <laughs> somewhat. <laughs> uh, they got about $1.5 million in real estate, $500,000 in a brokerage account, $2.5 million in a 401k. Oh, boy. So that looks like uh, $4.5 million. Okay. Questions. I have two main concerns. Want my pa- uh, I was going to say something bad. But... <laughs> my in-laws' RMD is significantly higher than their expenses. They would like to give us pre-inheritance gifts so we can max out our retirement savings. And invest in more real estate. We have been told that since my wife is their sole heir, this can be done without involving the gift tax. But I can't find anything verifying this on the IRS website. I love your input on this one. Okay. Okay. Trying to plan for the increased taxable income from the 
10-year distribution of the inherited IRA so we have all the money in the right buckets when the inevitable occurs. Uh, my plan is to have no other taxable income during this 10-year period except for royalties. There's that royalty. Yeah, yeah. And pension number two. My thought is to convert all or most of the IRAs into a Roth while we have plenty of room in the 22% tax bracket. Does this make sense to you? Is there anything else we should consider? Jack and Diane. All right. So there's a couple of different things we got to unpack here. Yeah. So he wants to retire soon here. So this was a fairly long. Um, he's 58 and she's 52. Right. Okay. And so I'm not sure he said when he wants to retire. Yeah. I didn't see that. Either. Yeah. I think that. Um, they, they might be waiting for the, the inevitable. Okay. No, I'm just right. guessing. That's a, that's a triggering event. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I'll take the first question, Joe, while you think about the second one. So so the um, here, here's the way um, inheritance and gifting works. So you're allowed to give $17,000 a year in 2023 to anybody you want to, family, friends, homeless person it doesn't matter 17,000 per year and if you're married your spouse can give 17,000 a year so that means Jack and Diane Diane's parents can give each of you I mean the total 34,000 because there's two of them so what's that 68,000 is what they can give to you without any any consequence at all if they give you more than that you just have to file a gift tax return you don't pay any current tax if you file a gift tax return, all that does is it reduces the final estate tax credit, right? That you would get passing heirs to the, passing assets to the next generation. And right now that credit and the accountants are going to say, I'm saying this wrong, but I'm keeping it simple. It's a unified credit. I get that. But let's just say that the credit that, that you can pass to the next generation is roughly 12, 13 million dollars each right so i think it's 12 and a half i think it's 25 million dollars a couple can pass to the next generation so like let's say they give you two hundred thousand dollars well the first 68 no problem but the extra one hundred thirty-two thousand has got to go on that gift tax return to get subtracted from the 25 million from the unified unified credit and yeah. it, simple as that right it's in in practice it's more complicated but that's the concept so the the, um, the parents net worth is Three, four and a half four, million. Four and a half. And so it's well below the limit. But I don't know what state they live in. So if they live in, let's say, Washington. Oh, good point. Right. Because there could be a state true tax on for the state. Good point. Um, <clears throat> but I, I'm so since she's the sole heir, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Because he's like, well, she's the sole heir. So there's no there's no tax. Yeah. No, that that. It, it's still there's a state tax and and here's the risk right which is right now it's i think around 25 million dollars it would pass to the next generation for a couple but that could come down that could come back down to there's talk of that coming back down to 5 million which would be 10 million for a couple or lower right so it was 600,000 i know for most of my career <laughs> <laughs> yeah it went 650,000 yeah when i started it actually got to a million in the year 2000. I remember that yep. because that's when uh, George W. Bush came into office and basically tried to eliminate it. Yep. And he did for a year, did. 2011. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, okay. So you can, they can gift yeah. quite a bit to you. No, no. no problem. A million bucks, whatever, whatever they want to gift to you. That's, that's the mechanics and there's no current tax to be paid. So let's say they got a million and a half of real estate that they give this to Jack and Diane. Yeah. Right. And Jack and Diane wants to sell it. The only problem with the gift is that if they sell that asset, then they're going to have to pay the capital gains. The, the, the basis carries over. That's right. So if they inherit that property or inherit the assets, they get a step up in basis, they could sell it, and then there would be no tax due. Yeah, that's that's true. The biggest issue that they have is this two and a half million dollars. This two and a half million dollars is probably kicking out. What do you think? Well, they're, uh, they're in their 90s. So, a so a couple hundred thousand dollars of income. Um, yeah, no, two and a half, I'm going to say Six percent, seven percent um, distribution rate. That's yeah, probably something like that. One hundred seventy-five. Is he? But you're about right. Yeah. A couple hundred thousand. So two hundred thousand dollars of the income that's forced out of the retirement account. <clears throat> yeah. So and they're not spending any of it. So they could give you whatever distribution out of the retirement account, 
and that would be tax free to you. They would, again, just have to file the gift tax return. Uh, then you could buy your real estate and everything else. But where he's thinking, he's like, okay, well, when they pass, they're going to get this two and a half million dollars or whatever the dollar figure is in this 401k plan. And since the death of the stretch IRA, they're going to have to take this money out over a 10 year time period. Right. So then they're like, okay, well, here, I want to avoid or, or negate any type of other income because it's going to eat up you know, my tax bracket as I take this two and a half million dollars out. So from now, he wants to do Roth conversions and things like that to to try to, to to mitigate this. But he's 52 years old, right? He's 58, 58 years old. 58, yeah. Um, his RMDs are not going to start until 75. Right. So he's got 20 years about. Right. And, uh, and the 401k, when you inherit that, you can't do conversions on any kind of Right. He's going to have to take IRA that out 401k. over 10 years. That's right. So, the, I, you know, the, the parents could start doing Roth conversions if they're in a low enough tax bracket. Right. But, but the RMD is killing them. So maybe they convert to the top of the 24. Maybe. That would be a nice gift. Yeah. Right. Because then all of a sudden you get Roth money versus sure. tax deferred money. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. Nope. That, that, that makes sense. And by the way, when you're talking gifts, you can never gift your retirement account, only like real estate, brokerage account. Can't, can't gift an IRA, 401k, Roth, whatever. All right. We got to take a break. Thanks for the uh, long question. We got uh, Matt, uh, let's see, okay. from uh, San Diego. All right. He goes, hey, Joe, Big Al, Andy, I'm 31 years old and a lawyer at a large, large law firm. Expect to make about $500,000 a year. My fiance was recently laid off from her job in marketing and Assuming she doesn't go back to work this year, we'll make around forty thousand dollars. We'll be married this year and expect to file taxes jointly for twenty twenty three and into the future. Well, congratulations on your nuptials. Yes. Um, my grandmother passed away a few months ago. Sorry to hear that. Uh, and I recently learned I was named the beneficiary on her IRA accounts. I stand to inherit about one hundred fifty thousand dollars from the IRA. There are at least a few options for which to do about the inherited IRA. And I'd like to get your thoughts on what to do. I wonder whatever happened to that kid that said he was going to like inherit like 200 million. Yeah, that's right. Right. Wasn't that Andy? It was a that big. That sounds a familiar, but yeah, it's, it's been a while. We haven't heard anything about it. Maybe the kid's still waiting. It's like, I got a weird question for you. I remember that. And then I'm, gonna here stand, I'm, I'm getting 200 million I'm gonna, in a couple of months. I'm going to inherit 200 million. Um, <laughs> what should I do with it? Yeah, this is more reasonable here. Yeah, right. All right. So he's got some options. Um, I can leave the money in an inherited IRA account up to 10 years. Uh, this seems to be conventional wisdom, but I worry it could be worse for us, especially if our incomes increase during that time and if tax rates increase and for what it's worth. I'm expecting both those things to happen. Though it's possible we'll have a down or sabbatical year at some point. A little sabbatical year. Right. Uh, regardless, how do I get a sabbatical year? I think you I'm not gonna, be president and CEO of the company. I think I'm going to put in for that. Uh, uh, reject it <laughs> as, as the chairman. I think, I'm gonna, I think I know someone at this company. Maybe I'll put that in. Uh, regardless, uh, there would probably be the best bet if there's meaningful stock market growth in the 10 years, uh, but that seems far from guaranteed. True. Okay. Number two. So he, he could say, Hey, you want, I just want to leave this in the overall account for 10 years. I'll pull it out in 10 years. Yeah. I don't like that idea too much because, Hey, we're going to be in, my wife and I are not going to be working. He's a badass attorney. He's going to have a lot more income. She's going to have a lot more income. And then when they take the money out in that 10th year, it's going to get killed in tax. Yeah. Plus you don't want to do that anyway, because if the stock market, if you kill it in the market, you want it outside of the retirement account. So it's capital gains instead of ordinary income. Number two, I can trickle the money out over the 10 years, but this faces pretty much the same issues as option one. We're squarely in the 35% federal, 11% California tax brackets. And those rates may only increase in the future. Uh, okay, number three, I can withdraw all the money now and pay the tax. That would suck and would sacrifice potential tax-free growth, but provide certainty as to the price of withdrawal and could wind up better in the long run than the other options. Can you please spitball this? I'm thinking, am I thinking about this correctly? Also, related, 
Would having an inherited IRA affect my ability to use a backdoor Roth? I don't think so because I read online that inherited IRAs don't count for the pro rata rule, but are appreciated if you can confirm. Uh, thanks so much in advance for your thoughts. I'm a longtime listener and love the show, but I'm writing in for the first time. A lot of first time writer in. Yeah, I like it. Keep them coming. Man, we got like 100 questions here this week. I drive a little 2012 Toyota Camry. 2012, dude, this guy's like a badass attorney right. driving a little Camry. 500,000. God, he's very like cautious. Yeah. Isn't okay. that how rich people stay rich is by yes. living with it well within their means? Well, but yeah, that's why um, Alan has two places in Hawaii. <laughs> drives a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> and I go to Fiji and yes, he goes to Fiji. I went to I went to New Zealand in February uh, last fall. I went to Italy. I don't drink much, but when I do, I for a good IPA. <laughs> okay, like it. All right. Well, fiance is in a little 2022 Mazda CX5. Likes a glass of red wine at the end of every single day. Like it. All right. Well, Matt, I think you can upgrade your car if you want. I wonder if it's one glass. Two glasses of wine. Well, <laughs> she's unemployed. You know, he says she might be. Well, well before he gets home, uh, we don't know. Yeah. Thursdays, the wife likes to have a couple glasses there at the old Anderson household. Only Thursday? Yeah. It seems really? like Thursday. That's the day. Uh, yeah. And that's why I work really late on Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> I was always, I was wondering why that was. Yeah. It's, if I'm not having a cock, because I don't drink on the week. No, I know you don't. If I, you know, if I'm having a few cocktails, then I can kind of tolerate the, you know, someone else having cocktails. That's, yeah. No, I, I get if that. If he has one glass, I don't really, I don't, I don't see it. Yeah, right. But I think that second or third glass. That you start you know, seeing, oh, then you can say, like, uh, okay, this is annoying. Wow, problem. the tables are turned. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. It's, sometimes it happens there, Andy. <laughs> Um, what does he do? Just blow the, th the thing out, just pay the tax, or does he trickle it out because he's squarely in the 35% tax bracket? Me personally, I would trickle it out because if there's any chance of a sabbatical year, blow the rest out then. That's what I would do. I would do the same. And then if we have another down year, let's say, because this year the stock market is doing quite well. Yeah. Right. So maybe next year the market's down 20%, then I would blow the whole thing that's, out. That's another reason, right? Because you want the you you want the money out and let the recovery happen when it's outside of retirement because now it's capital gain, not ordinary income. Yep. So you, you could kind of play both ways. You dollar cost average out, you take a little bit out each year. Um, but then if the market goes, then, you know, yeah. And one thing, Matt, when you say in number three, this that would suck and I would sacrifice potential tax free growth. What you mean is tax, tax deferred. deferred growth. That's a whole lot different. Tax free is a Roth IRA. You never pay tax. Tax deferred means you will pay the tax later and it accumulates over time. All right, Matt. Appreciate the phone call. I mean, appreciate the, the question. Um, thanks for listening and thanks for the first uh, first time. Uh, email. When it's time for your beneficiaries to inherit your assets, they will love it if everything was as easy and straightforward as possible. So help them out. Give them a document that contains everything they need to know about your life, your accounts, and your estate before you pass. Download our estate planning organizer from the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. It's organized into helpful blank sections so that you can simply fill out everything from your financial account details and insurance policies to your contacts and your final wishes. Then go ahead and put it in a safe place and give a copy to your family and your loved ones. And don't forget to update it regularly. To get your free estate plan organizer, just click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app. You'll see it right there under free resources just before the episode transcript. I got Clay from Westerville, Ohio. Yeah. Part of Columbus, I guess. You've never heard of Westerville? <laughs> no. <laughs> I You've been there, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I will try to keep the spitball question brief and in complete sentences. Well, thank you, Clay. That's very nice. Very nice of you. Uh, in my case, I'm still a minimum of 12 years away from retirement. I'm 43 years old. I know my estimate income need at various retirement ages in the amount needed to achieve that income. Wow. <laughs> look at Clay the, is on top of it. Look at the big brain on and, Clay. And he writes in complete sentences. This is, a, this is like a dream. Oh, my, it's Clay's <laughs> like one of the smartest listeners we've ever had. <laughs> Here's the spitball question. Uh, I've calculated my estimated portfolio balances by year based on my projected rate of return and contributions. 
Uh, could you imagine this guy's spreadsheet? Oh yeah, it's <laughs> it's, it's legit. A, it's got tabs <laughs> all over the place for <laughs> different assumptions. Oh, you think he's an engineer? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Uh, if the portfolio balance at the end of the year exceeds the amount projected in my retirement projections for that year, would it make sense to take that little extra and park it into something more safe or more aggressive, depending on your risk tolerance? For example, at the end of 2023, my retirement portfolio projections indicate my balance should be $1 million to achieve my retirement goal. But let's say the portfolio is $1.1 million. Does it make sense to take that $100 and park it in a stable value fund or something really aggressive, depending on your risk tolerance? Interesting question. Interesting <laughs> question, Clay. I love it. <laughs> Me too. I'll give you my answer. Uh, no. No. <laughs> I save as yours. <laughs> and here's why, Clay. It's because, yeah, so this year, 100000 over. Next year, 100000 behind. Just keep the right investment strategy going for a long period of time, and it will all balance out. Yeah. I'd love the idea though. So, yeah. it, it, you know, because this guy's super smart. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and he's got things so dialed in. I mean, <laughs> I think if it was anyone else, the answer is no. But I think from from Clay from Westerville here, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm well, going to give him a little bit of leeway. Yeah, and it's probably he's probably like a gambler. He's thinking about oh, this is house money. Right? Yeah, I'm just going to exactly I know, do what I, I want. There's with a bias on yeah, that, right? Right. 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 You know, if you win, here I'm going to put my chips that I had that yeah. I put out. I'm going to put those in my pocket. That's, yeah. And I'm going to bet with house money. And if I blow this thing up, who gives it? <laughs> you know what? No, don't do that. So, yeah. So he wants to bet with the house money. He either wants to put it in his wife's purse, yeah. right? Or he wants to put it on black. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or green. you're right. <laughs> well, maybe not his wife's purse, maybe. <laughs> or his pocket, maybe or under the mattress. Yeah, I don't know. When I gamble, like if when, if I'm with my wife, does it go to Rosie? Oh, uh, yeah, she takes it. She puts it in her purse. <laughs> I can totally see uh, that. She's like, "All right, you're this is <laughs> you're done with this. <laughs> you're not allowed to spend this on alcohol." <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I, that's why I don't gamble. I, I'm not a good gambler. And then it's like, okay, if I got house money, I'm going black every time. I'm gonna, you know, triple down. I'm gonna, <laughs> right? I'm gonna put everything on, you know, whatever. But I like the idea. I, I would, it, I would say, all right, well, I got a hundred thousand. Let's 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 go. Let's do something. Right, now, right. depending on his risk tolerance, he could be on the other side of it and go into a stable fund, and you sure. park and bank that money. Sure, I like that too. If, but for everyone else, I think the answer is that everything kind of. You know, it works its way out. Flows. So the so, market doesn't work in a straight line. So next year, when you're a hundred thousand short, do you pull it out of your purse and put it back in? <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, my projection. I should be at one point three point two million. Oh wait a minute, I spent the purse money. Yes, or I blew it, or I blew it up. Right. <laughs> so the the objective, Clay, I, I think, is what you want to look at, and I think what he's doing is that all right. Well, here I want to have a target rate of return of six percent, and if you ever look at the overall markets, let's say if it's six percent or eight percent, what's the market averaged over the last eighty years? Like twelve or eleven? Yeah, well, the yeah, the broader market is just under ten. S and P. Okay, so ten percent. You th how often do you think the market has done ten percent? We already know the answer. Zero. Zero. It's never happened. It's never, it's never actually done the average. Because you're going to get 20%, negative 10, up 5, down 4, up 30, down 10, right? And so you're going to average everything out to your target expected rate of return over your, you know, time period. So that's why taking some chips off the table and not, not betting on like it's probably yeah. not a great idea. No. All right. Awesome question. That was a lot of fun. Thank you, sir. Elizabeth writes in from Lake Forest. Al goes, hi, Joe, Al, Nanny. Long time listener. Looking every week to hear your show. You guys are funny. And this one actually right. says Annie, which is the first time I've ever actually been mistaken for Al's wife. I'm Andy. Ooh. Al's wife is Annie. Ooh. I think we should get Annie in here. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, my question is, if I sell losing stocks in a pre-tax IRA, can I offset those losses against gains from sale of a real estate property? Those are long-term losses, and property is in my possession for 12 years. Thank you very kindly for all the information you provide each week. All right. Well, thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah. Uh, good question. So she's got some losses in a retirement account. She sold a property, and she's yeah. got some gains, and she's like, well, can I offset those losses with those gains? Yeah, and she's thinking it's pre-tax, so there's basis in there. And fortunately, the answer is no. 
And the reason it's no is because everything inside an IRA, to the extent it's gain, is going to be ordinary income when you withdraw it. It's, it has nothing to do with your assets outside of retirement. I wish it did. So let's let's kind of review that. So if you've got um, if you've got some stock gains or real estate gains or whatever stock or real estate, you can offset your stock losses against those gains as long as it's outside of retirement accounts. So that's kind of the way that works. So you, you sold a property, you have a hundred fifty thousand dollar gain. You sold some stocks at losses of, of fifty thousand. So those that fifty thousand nets against the one fifty, you end up paying tax capital gains on a hundred thousand. That's how that works. If you don't have any gains, you had a fifty thousand dollar stock loss, then you get to deduct three thousand dollars against ordinary income. And the rest, $47,000, carries forward to the next year. And you do the same computation. That $47,000 can net against any stock gains, any real estate gains. If you don't have any, you get another $3,000. And now, now you got, what, $44,000 uh, available for the following year. But yeah, when you've got losses in an IRA, in a Roth, IRA pre-tax or post-tax, doesn't matter. Remember that little miscellaneous deduction you could take? Yeah, that's when we used God, to be able to itemize stuff. So complicated. It was. You could only probably take a couple of bucks. Yeah, yeah. There, there used to be a rule. It's not no longer anymore, but there used to be a rule where if you had, if you did a, a IRA contribution and went down, <laughs> you could withdraw it and actually take a loss on your on your tax return. But it was an itemized deduction. It wasn't a, a, a good loss, and a lot of people couldn't use it. Yeah. So anyway, that that's not available. All right. Well, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, all right, let's go to Scott from North Carolina. AGL Big Al, recently retired at 60, along with my better half of 35 years. Well, congratulations there. Tar Heel same, same Transplant. As, same as me, 35 years. 35 years, Big Al? Married in uh, 1988. Wow, that's, uh, that's impressive. Yeah. Tar I want to see the hairstyles for that 1988 wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I like Sorry, anyway. <laughs> Identical. <laughs> um, Tar Heel Transplants driving a 2023 Honda Passport and share the home with eight four-legged fur babies, three dogs, two cats, two horses. Wow. That's, Sh- that's even more than you. Wow. Should have been a vet. <laughs> <laughs> I got a dog, two kids. and Yeah. Um, I enjoy a cold rolling rock from time to time. In a lifetime member of Bill's Mafia. All right. Yeah, a little Bill's fan. Huh? Yeah. My question concerns HSA accounts. Both my wife and I have an HSA. That's a health savings account. Along, Although we no longer work, uh, we continue to par- participate in our employer's respective high deductible health insurance plans and expect to do so until Medicare kicks in at 65. We would both like to continue maxing out contributions to the HSA accounts, but wonder how best to do so since we are no longer working. I've also heard that you can make one-time contributions from your IRA to your HSA. Is this true? We have about $35,000 in HSA funds and would like to grow those as much as possible before hitting 65. Any advice is greatly appreciated. P.S. Having only heard your voices on the podcast. I was surprised how far apart my mental images of your faces <laughs> differ from your website's glamour shots. Well, Scott, he doesn't say if that's good have, or bad. You have to tell us what you mean uh, by he's that. Be like a toupee boy. He, in he goes, <laughs> he's thinking, he's thinking, I thought you guys had a face for radio and you're gorgeous, oh, handsome, or, or maybe the other way. Yes. I'm glad you're only on radio. You are a very handsome man. But yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. With my toupee, yeah, my supposed toupee. Yep, yeah. What? Are, no, I'm not even going to go there. Let's. Uh, why, why don't we answer this question? Here, okay. Buddy. Well, we'll start with HSA. Uh, yes, you can still contribute to an HSA plan, even though you're not employed, as long as you have a high. Uh, help me out. A high deductible health insurance. Plan. Thank you. High deductible health insurance plan, which basically is the kind of plan where. You know, there, there's it's high deductible, so it, there's you have to pay in a lot before it, it sort of kicks in, right? But if you have a plan like that, and you will know because it will say right on it that it's it's a HSA type plan, then you can tr- contribute. You can for 2023, you can contribute three thousand eight hundred fifty dollars per person or a family membership of seven thousand seven fifty, and there's a thousand dollar catch up when you are fifty 
65 and older, but you got to stop when you're Medicare age, which is 65. So the benefit of having an HSA yeah. is that well, you get little tax-free withdrawals. It's a triple tax threat. Yeah. You you know what? It's, it's, uh, it's better than a Roth in a sense, right? Because you get a tax deduction, unlike a Roth. The difference is you have to spend it on something medical related, but if you do that, it's tax-free. So think of a Roth, you don't get a tax deduction and you can spend it for whatever you want to. In this case, as long as you spend it for medical, you got a tax deduction and then you never pay tax on it. So it's a it's actually a great deal if you qualify. Right. All right. Hopefully that uh, helps, Scott. And um, I wonder what he was thinking about with her. Well, but her, the, what, the mental images. Well, I don't know. But one more Mike thing. Smith, for what, you. I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> Mike's getting older now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you've seen it recently. Uh, anyway, one more one more thing was uh, you can make a, a contribution or, or whatever you call it from an uh, IRA to an HSA. It's a one time, once in a lifetime, and it's for the contribution amount. You have to be uh, eligible with a high deductible health insurance plan, and it's you're limited to the contribution limit. So it's it's not much. Right. A few thousand bucks, seven yep. thousand bucks. Yeah, yeah. So you just transfer it, so there's no tax, and then yep. it grows tax deferred, and then when you pull it out for medical purposes, it is tax free. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks for the question, Scott. When you're investing, do you feel like you're on an emotional roller coaster, careening from feelings of euphoria to feelings of depression? Most people admit that they know they shouldn't let their emotions drive their investment decisions, but when we see those highs and lows of the market, it can be really difficult not to let our emotions and investing biases override our logic. We are our own worst enemy. Go to the podcast show notes to watch Emotional Investing. It's the latest episode of the Your Money, Your Wealth TV show and learn more from Joe and Big Al about behavioral finance. Download the companion Emotionless Investing Guide and calm those nerves. Learn how keeping a level head can help improve your investing returns. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app to go to the show notes, watch YMYWTV, and download the Emotionless Investing Guide. We got, um, hey, Joe and Al, I have a question about paying for college. I have two college aged daughters. One with uh, two years left at $80,000 a year. Okay. What's that? CU? <laughs> That's Harvard. Yeah, it's it, one of those, sure. Um, it's not University of Florida, I don't think. No, and it's not San Diego State. Uh, I got another one. Uh, four years left, fifty thousand a year. Wow, he's got some smart kids. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and the, the, and a big wallet. <laughs> he's got hopefully a, got about one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars remaining in his five twenty-nine plan balance. After using up to five twenty-nine, I have highly appreciated RSUs. Uh, those are restricted stock units. His three hundred thousand dollar balance with a hundred thousand dollar basis earmarked for the remaining college costs. I was looking at gifting the stock to each child to limit some of the capital gains tax and having them file taxes as non-dependents, but I'm fearful of getting caught up in the kitty tax. Yes. <laughs> Sounds like a great strategy. It does. And then having to pay the taxes on the capital gains at the highest marginal rate versus capital gains rate of 15%. Both kids have W-2 income from summer jobs. And then the gifts add $34,000, 17 from me and my wife to each child. Can you talk about the kitty tax strategies on this scenario and tax avoidance? Our AGI is currently $350,000. Love the show. Uh, my rides. He rides a 2019 Toyota RAV4 hybrid. Oh, I'm conscious of the yeah, like environment. It. Yeah, I like it. 2020 Pilot Trail 429. Pivot. Is that a pivot? Pivot oh, trail. Pilot. Yeah. Pivot trail. Pivot. All right, let's talk about kitty tax. Okay, so <laughs> the way kitty tax works is if your child is not yet 18 or if they're not yet age 24 and they're a full-time college student, then the kitty tax applies, which basically means that uh, the once the child has investment income of more than $2,300, it's at the parent's rate, right? And so in this particular case, virtually almost all of this would be above that 2300 so, I mean, if you transfer it to the kids, yeah, the kids could sell it. They're not going to pay the top rate. It's not like trust taxes, but they're going to pay the parents rate, which would be 15%. And you you can elect to, to have that rate paid right on the parents' tax return. You can do that. Uh, but yeah, kitty tax will apply. It's a 15% tax plus a state of Maryland, whatever tax rate that is. 
seems like a lot of work to save a couple of bucks, but maybe you got the 2300. Uh, but th here's what Corey was thinking is that, you know what, I'm going to have the kids file their own tax return non-dependent. And so they'll have a standard deduction. They got five thousand dollars of income. So there's going to be room here in the ta in the capital gain room where they're going to sell it, and then they're going to save a lot of money in taxes. But it's a gift from the parents to a child, where then the IRS looks at this and says, "Hey, I get it that if they're filing their own tax returns and they have a standard deduction and anything in the fifteen percent tax bracket, capital gains would be taxed at zero, and so on and so forth." You can't. No, because the standard deduction doesn't apply when it's when it's unearned income, interest, dividends, capital gains. So you you get almost nothing in standard deduction. So basically, there could be a couple dollars saved, but essentially the basis, in other words, the gain that the parent would have paid, the kid pays, and most of it, the majority of it, will be at the parent's rate. Right, but let's say he's got three hundred fifty thousand dollars of income. Sure. So he could be stuck with that investment income tax on the capital gain. Could be right. And maybe he has other capital gains as well. But again, the kids pay at the parents' rate, so they would be stuck with it. Right. So he's trying to avoid all yeah, of that by yeah. putting it on the kid's tax return. That's what he is. And actually, it was a decent strategy before these rules came into effect, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. So a little bit behind, Corey. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good idea, though. Let's go to uh, Rich in New York. Uh, Joan Allen, 57. Has 1.7 in combined Roth 401k and brokerage accounts with rental properties worth four million. Okay. In my own business. Wow. It's worth 40 million. <laughs> <laughs> and a Jeep. <laughs> and I got a, a Jeep Cherokee worth uh 15 grand. <laughs> so what the hell's going on? He's got 1.7 in combined Roth. Yeah. All right. Bunch of rental properties. He's got 401k and brokerage accounts with rental properties worth four million. Yeah. No, no, no. The 1.7 is combined Roth 401k and brokerage. Then he's yeah. got rental properties worth $4 million, yes. And he's got his own business. I, What's a business worth? I would agree. He didn't say. But you claim it's $40 million. I know. He's coming out hot, though. <laughs> you just... When you when you put your million-dollar amount at the very first sentence. I mean, it's not even before, hey, Joe, and Al. It's like, I have $70 million. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I'm 57 with about 1.7. 1, 2, yeah, 3, five, 4. Five four the, the fifth word yep. in. 1.7 million. I love Did you notice guy. that, that I, I got 1.7? I love it. This guy's <laughs> I don't want you to miss it. Yep. I drive a 2015 Jeep. All right. My question is this. I max everything, including a mega back door, an additional DB plan. Okay. I was thinking of supercharging a 529 plan with myself as beneficiary. The penalty for taking non-qualified expenses is 10%. Thoughts on this? As an additional way to add tax deferred growth, I could change beneficiaries so that the penalty goes away or to my grandkids. Okay. I I don't like it at all. So, well, 529 plan is, is like a college plan. In other words, you put money in, you pick a beneficiary, typically son, daughter, grandchild, ty sure. typically. Could be, could be yourself, spouse, doesn't really matter. But you put the money in, there's no tax deduction going in. But all that growth is tax-free as long as you spend it for qualified education expenses. So he wants to use the tax deferral, but it's going to be ordinary income plus a 10% penalty if he uses it for non-educational expenses. I mean, it's a great idea. I don't know if he's married, whether he's got kids, grandkids. If you think you're going to have a lot of beneficiaries later on, sure, maybe that's a good good thing to do. But I think he's using it as a tax-deferred vehicle, that's and what, it's the so, worst idea I've ever heard. That's what it sounds like, yeah. So, no, you use a brokerage account to get capital gains tax versus deferral with ordinary income and a 10% penalty. 100% agree. Yeah, you're you're really trying to overthink this a little bit, I would say. Yeah. What would be the benefit of it? Why 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 is he thinking that this is a possibility, it, that it, this it, might it, be a good idea? Tax, if you're going to use it for education, it's a great idea. If you're going to use it for something other than education, don't do it. Right. Well, now that you can secure act, you can put a couple of bucks into a Roth. That's a lot of work and hard. All right. So but if he's can. looking to fund his his own education, he's 57. He's yeah. not going to school. The guy's, a, what? He's got 1.7 out and he's got a business. He's got 4 million in real estate. He's got everything. Going back to college. 
So what is he's like um uh, what what's his name? Going back to school? Um Rodney right Dangerfield? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. What what's that movie called? Back to school. Back yeah. to school, yeah. 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 <laughs> this is Rodney. Yeah, Rodney. He's going back to school. He's gonna I, giant fund of five twenty nine plan. Yeah, he's gonna join his kid at school. So it's for if it's for kids. Little school class or the yeah, I know. team. But, if it's for kids or grandkids, I'm okay with the idea. If you think it's a great idea to get more tax deferred growth, uh, you're just kidding yourself. You're going to pay ordinary income plus penalty. Yeah, you're going to get killed. All right. Okay, we're done. What are you waving? You're waving I'm at? saying goodbye. That's the all end. Right. Hey, that's it. We got to go. Show's called Your Money Well. Thanks all. We'll see you next week. Your lovely host, NPR's Car Talk, Cheers, and Sports Fashion in the lovely derails at the end of the episode, so stick around. Help new listeners find YMYW by sharing the show with your friends, family, and colleagues, and by leaving your honest reviews and ratings for Your Money, Your Wealth in Apple Podcasts and any other podcast app that accepts them. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call us at 888-994-6257 and schedule a free financial assessment in person at one of our seven offices around the country or online at a date and time convenient for you no matter where you are. Chances are one of the experienced financial professionals on Joe and Big Al's team at Pure will be able to identify strategies to help you create a more successful retirement. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. Hey, welcome back. Or hello, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Just got from what's, your mouth. What's, what's up? Going on? What's up? Uh, my name's Joey Anderson. I am your lovely host. I'm with Big Al Clopeline and, of course, the lovely Andy Last. Did you We're call all lovely? Lovely host? No. Uh, maybe did I? <laughs> said Joe Anderson, your lovely host. I'm a lovely host. <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah. Usually when you I'm say- going to start using like adjectives like beautiful and <laughs> lovely. Usually when you say it yourself, it doesn't carry it the same way. I don't. Oh, God. <laughs> Trust me. Um, all right. Yeah, we're, not, we're off to a hot start here. We are. Today. We've already used most of the show. Love the banter? Helpful information. In one of the episodes, the listener compared John Big Al to Tom and Ray Megalazzoni. It's pretty close. <laughs> close enough. <laughs> How do you pronounce that? I think it's Magliozzi. Magliozzi. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, from NPR's Car Talk. Uh, this comparison is accurate, uh, but I would like to submit that there is an element of Norm and Cliff from Cheers. Oh, let's see who's here. Oh, Big Al sounds like George Wynn. Oh, I, I get to be Norm. You're Norm. You have to be Cliff. Uh, Cliff and Clayton? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Maybe, maybe you sound like him. God, I just have zero respect for all these people. <laughs> Cliff, all right. Yeah, Cliff Clavin. Yeah, I could see you sitting at a bar, you know, <laughs> I'll, hanging out. I'll, I'll you, sit. You got I'll, beer I'll be. A, I'll, I'll walk in. Ow! I'll sit on the corner stool, and, and you'll walk in. Nothing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Crickets. This is a mailman. Uh, either way, very informative and very entertaining podcast. So far, I've listened to about 30 episodes, and I'm looking forward to listening to the entire catalog. Oh, my goodness. I feel bad for this guy. <laughs> Are they that good? Oh, uh, they're terrible. <laughs> How many have you listened to? Uh, zero. zero. No, I've listened to, um, I don't know, Andy did a special one. I don't know, was that a couple last year, a couple years ago? I listened to that. I thought Andy did a really good job. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's the only one I listened yeah, to. Yeah, I'm probably not much better. Maybe one or two. Yeah. No. No. Good thing the listeners like the show. <laughs> yeah, good thing. Yeah. We don't. We, we don't should, know. We, we don't know how we sound. We should listen. To say, <laughs> we should. We, we, you know what? We we should probably stop saying that. Probably stop doing that. Maybe be a little bit more prepared. We we've had no feedback for fifteen years. <laughs> <laughs> probably should <laughs> do a little self critique. Oh boy! No, I'm gonna pass. <laughs> All right. Either you like the show, or you don't. Yes. Um, I never heard of a pin. Me neither. It's probably electric. I don't know. Sounds cool. Oh, it's a bicycle. Oh, oh that's go. why we hadn't heard of it. It's like a what? A bicycle? Human powered. Wow. Oh, Pivot Trail 2020. Must. Just, I wonder if he wears the bike gear. Probably. Do you I have mean, to wear the bike gear to, to, to have? Well, I all I can tell you is I used to ride my bike more, but I didn't have the gear. 
You know where you made fun of, or no one wasted me. I, I was an outcast. You got to wear the jersey. <laughs> yeah, they got to wear the super tight bike pants. I, I think so. You and know, the, when you're jogging, you always nod to the other jogger. No, right? I, you, oh, you never jog, so you wouldn't know. I would have done. And same thing with bikers, unless you're not wearing the outfit. No, but you wear the outfit. I, I just, I, I got a pair of biker pants because. I had I, our next door neighbor used to have a sporting goods store, and she said, "This is all the rage." And I wore it around the neighborhood. It was uh, pretty revealing. Uh, and, and the women <laughs> said, uh, "I don't think so." Yeah. yeah, I just couldn't see myself going in the the like the, the outfit. Yeah, I yeah. just uh, I'm you know, like I would. Oh yeah, I used to take spin class before I got the old Peloton. Yeah, okay. Oh, uh, there was hardcore guys in there, just sure. all decked out. Yeah, right. Like Mikey Martin. Yeah, okay. that guy comes over after a bike ride and he's wearing like he's he looks like the biggest douche in the world. I, well, <laughs> I could see that. <laughs> Can I see that on this podcast? Not really. Well, you have now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, what are you doing? So I don't know. I would just wear sh shorts and t-shirt. Yeah, same. But anyway, you He's won't get like the zipper. Just, just and... telling you, you're not going to get waved to by your fellow biker mates. Got it. <laughs> about if, or is that the same? Is like it, I play quite a bit of golf. Yeah. Right. And so I wear a collared shirt. I wear a hat. I either wear. You wear um, the nice golf socks. Yes. So I mean, is that an equivalent? You think? Yeah. Versus me like wearing just shorts and a t-shirt, but yeah. I probably couldn't get on my club if I did that. Probably not. But there are definitely better dressed people on the course than others but if i went let's say i went on a bike ride with all these bikers and i didn't have the gear would, would i be frowned upon do you think i think so no. i bet you probably would yeah at least at least that's been my experience on, See, on the few times i did it yeah and it's all supposed to be about exercise but you know that just goes out the window with biking right. fashion and spin class fashion and golfing fashion yeah you, he's got the hat you know with the bill that, that yeah, comes yeah. Out. I, I know what you're talking about okay anyway 